And let me say a good day to you, wherever you may be, uh, joining us uh, for our time together. Uh, once again, in the Word, I, uh, I apologize for not being able to be with you last week. Uh, things at uh, work have been a little extra, with people off, and I've had some issues uh, with uh, some medical things. I need to get set up. I really wasn't quite set up to start, but that doesn't matter. We're going to start from here. And again, thank you for being with me for some time together on this beautiful day that the Lord has made to be in the Word. And let's ask his blessing upon our time. Father, we do want to come to you and thank you that we can call you Abba, that we come to you as our Father. What an awesome thing it is to know that you, who are God Almighty, the God of heaven and earth, the creator, the upholder, of all things, the Mighty One is also our personal Father. And it is as our Father we come to you today to ask you to do, Father, that which we are not able of our own selves, apart from your gracious help, to do. And that is to be able to see the wondrous truths that you have left for us in the Word. Truths, Father, that will help us to know you better to see with greater clarity just how much love you have for us, for all of the things you have done, things you continue to do. And so this morning, the particular blessing we ask to be upon us is that that comes from the gift of the Holy Spirit, another blessing from you. He who indwells us, he who is the teacher of truth, might he be pleased this morning to use this vessel, this very unworthy, servant father to communicate truth and then might he open the ears and the hearts of all those who might hear that they might understand how truly wonderful you are in all that you have provided for us in and through the person of our wonderful savior our lord jesus in whose name we thank you amen well, again, I'm sorry I couldn't be with you uh, last week, and I hope I'll be back next week. But at this moment, I would uh, like to introduce what I'm going to do today uh, by telling you about this man here. This is Dr. Herbert Lockyer, as you can see. Uh, Dr. Lockyer has gone home to be with the Lord. Uh, he was a minister, uh, author, and it's through his writings that I became acquainted with Dr. Lockyer. Dr. Lockyer has... Uh, a series of books, he's written over 50 books, but he has one particular series of books I have and I found to be very helpful over the years, particularly as I was a younger believer to, to read through. Uh, this series of Dr. Lockyer's is called the All Series. And the reason it's called the All Series is I think all of these books, perhaps with exception of one or two, uh, begin with the words all. Uh, he has, uh, the, you can see here, I have some of them up here. Uh, all the parables of the Bible, all the holy days and holidays, all the teachings of Jesus, all the divine names and titles, all the music, all the books and chapters, all about the Holy Spirit, all about the second coming, all the last words of saints and sinners. And this goes to this 21 volume set. Well, one of the books uh, of two that he has, uh, and I have one of them right here, is this book. Uh, perhaps you can see it, that is called All the Promises of the Bible. Now, in uh, this book, All the Promises, and I don't know if, because I have never read the Bible from the perspective of simply looking for one thing, which, what are the promises, and then breaking those promises down even further as to which promises might be applicable to me, to you today as a believer in Jesus Christ. I have never done that, so I don't know if this is a 351-page book. I don't know if it contains all of the promises in the Bible or not. I certainly know it contains a great many of them. I'm going to be honest with you, I don't even know how many promises there are in the Bible for sure. I have heard counts uh, as high as 30,000. Now, uh, I find that a little difficult to, to think, be accurate, because I know that there's 31,373 verses in the Bible. Other numbers range from anywhere from 3,000 to 8,100. There is a man, <coughs> Dr. Everett Storms, he was a professor 
in Kitchener, Ontario, uh, Canada. And he made, I'll certainly give him this, he made an, I'll give him a big E, a, a strong E for effort. Uh, during his 27th reading of the Bible, he set out and said at this time, what I'm going to do is to see how many promises I can find through that 27th reading of the scripture. And he made an exhaustive effort uh, to do that. Then he took his list of, uh, excuse me, promises that he found, and he compared them with uh, Dr. Lockyer's, all the promises in the Bible. And this is what he found to be the case. Promises that were made by God to man, he calculated 7,487. Promises by one man to another human being, 991 promises. And promises of God the Father to God the Son, two. Promises of man to God, 200. And 90. Promises of several other combinations, and that's all he wrote, 31. Promises made by Satan, nine. So his total number of promises that he found through his study were 8,810 promises. Now, again, I don't know, I would not verify the accuracy of the 8,810 count. Well, I'm guessing he's probably somewhere in, in the neighborhood uh, of being correct. And I don't know out of the 8,810 how many, again, apply directly to you and I as believers at this particular time. But what I do know, I do know something about the nature of the promises that apply to you and I, believers, and the nature of the promises that apply to believers uh, prior to the cross. And that is what is written in Second Peter. They're exceedingly great and precious promises. You and I have from God the Father exceedingly and great precious promises. And uh, included among those exceedingly great and precious promises, and perhaps yeah, I'm not, again, I've not ranked these. My mind's thinking about this. Surely I would put the, this one in the top 10 of all the exceedingly and great precious promises of God. And that is the promise that we find in Psalm 91.15, the verse I'm still kind of working my way through for a specific reason. We read, he, that is the person who set his love upon the Lord, that is the person who knows the Lord, personally, in, a, in, in having a personal relationship with him, that person will call upon me, Yahweh, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver and honor him. We see in the 91st Psalm and the 15th verse, one of several times we could look and see that God promises to answer the prayers of his people. And this is where we are at the 95th Psalm. We are looking at one of the promises of God. He's promised protection. We're looking at Psalm 91, 14 through 16. And this is the portion of the Psalm, the last uh, strophe, the last part of the Psalm. And in that unit of thought, we have a clear promise to God, a reiterated promise, and that is a promise of protection for you and I and for believers in times of trouble, in times of need, times of distress, times of agony. God has promised to protect believers, and we see in that promise a sub-promise, a subset promise, and that is God's promise to answer our prayers. And this is what I say is one of the, to me, one of the greatest of all the promises uh, in, in all of the scripture is the promise that you and I have. It's a promise of a surety. It's, it's one you can take to the bank. It's definitive. God will answer prayers. Again, this short part, he shall call upon me 
and I will answer him. That doesn't require a lot of clarification. And we have done, and I have done all the clarification with he shall call upon me that I'm going to do, and I will answer. There are some things I wanted to do with that because I know that God doesn't answer every prayer in the same way. I've got there are four primary ways that God answers prayers. I'm about to go to five, a little more work, and I think I'm pretty sure I have found a fifth way in which the Lord answers our prayers. In our previous uh, time together in the Word, I looked at one of the ways that God answers prayers. And I want you to be cognizant of these, of these ways that the Scripture says He answers prayers, because when you're in distress, when you're in trouble, or as the old saying goes, you know, when you're in the swamp and you're know, trying the alligators up to your neck, uh, I want you to know God, how God might answer that prayer so that you're not perhaps left discouraged, uh, disappointed, disillusioned, and then drawn away from continuing to pray to the Lord who answers our prayers. In our previous session, we covered, and I'm sorry I've got that somewhat covered up with my uh, face, immediate affirmative answers. One of the ways that God answers prayers is yes and right now. And we looked at a couple of examples of that in our previous class from 2 Kings 20 at verses 1 through 5, Acts 9, 40, Acts 12, 3 through 11, and 28, 8 are some examples. Now today, I want to direct your attention to another way that God might answer a prayer. It's always wonderful, uh, it, utterly delightful, when you get the immediate affirmative answer from God to a prayer. But sometimes that's not the way God answers. Sometimes we will get what I call a deferred affirmative answer to the prayer. Now, by deferred, I simply, an affirmative, affirmative, God is going to answer that prayer? Yes. By deferred, I mean, unlike immediate, it's not going to be immediate. Uh, length of time for the answer, I, I can't tell you. I'm going to show you some in scripture. Uh, two today, uh, and there are many. I think my mind's thinking about the prayer of Daniel right now. There was a 10-day lapse between the time God heard the prayer, the time it was answered. Uh, I think about a prayer for Paul uh, when he was at, uh, in this, what I believe to be the first Roman imprisonment. Prayer of the Philippian believers could have been as long as two years for an answer, but these are passages, and we'll look at some of these uh, this morning too, so I can show you from the scripture that sometimes God's answer is yes, but you're going to have to wait a while. And so that when you're praying and you don't get that immediate affirmative answer, not to become discouraged, not, not, you know, to, to, not to turn away from continuing to pray. It may be a def deferred affirmative. And God may not answer our prayers with an immediate yes. We may have to, as our little man looks down there, yeah, looking, and he's waiting, and he's tapping, because none of us like to wait. I've yet to meet any person who's looking for something good that says, oh, I'm enjoying waiting for getting that. It's certainly not my temperament. If it's something I want, something I think I need, something I think it will be good, but for me, the quicker the better. Uh, I'm not real patient when it comes to waiting for something that I desire, something that I want, something that I perceive, perceive to be need for me or helpful to me. I'm my, my little guy here, look at that watch, look at that watch, watching those grains of sand slowly grow through and say, oh, come on. And that is true with prayer. It's not easy to be in the affirmative but deferred position in prayer. But that is a reality of the way God answers prayer. Notice in the 69th Psalm, this is a, a prayer looking, this person is in a deep distress. Things are really going bad for David in, in this situation. And he does what any reasonable believer would do or should do, cries out to God, save me, save me. Okay, that's looking for deliverance, exactly what God promised. Save me, O oh God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. I sink deep 
in the mire, the quagmire, the mud, where there's no standing. I don't have any stability in life. I just, I, I just I, and I come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I'm overwhelmed it is the readout with this situation. I just, it, it, when I look at his words, I should have said this, his first two words, save, save me. Save, the word save in, in Hebrew is a command. Uh, it's a hifil, it, it's imperative. It's expressing intense emotion on the part of David. Obviously, as human beings, we are not in a position to command God. And you'll find many prayers in the Old Testament that are a cohortive or they're a juicive, that they're an imperative. And the point that, that it's not that the human being is being uh, disrespectful of God. It's not that he's acting in an indolence, uh, indolence kind of, uh, of manner of God. It's not that he's not regarding who God is and God's position, his majesty. Uh, it's just that the person is so intently in need of God's help that he cries out in this manner. I call this the, the imperative of prayer, and the imperative prayer is simply to re express the intense desire of the petitioner of God to please, please act. You might put it this way to paraphrase it, please will God save me. That's, and that's the kind of force that's behind uh, uh, this prayer. Uh, it's not presumptive, but just a strong, intense, emotional desire. He goes on, verse 2, they hate me without a cause. Now, we can now see that we're also looking at a psalm that has prophetic implications, because this was true of Messiah, of Jesus our Lord. They hate me without a cause. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. So there's more people that hate you than you have hair on your head? No, I take that as a hyperbole uh, in a poetic way, uh, but it's to express something. Uh, he's got a lot of enemies. I can't, uh, again, I can't verify this, but according to the Bauman Medical Institute group, the Bauman Medical Institute says that the average human being, and lady, I would like to have that beautiful hair of yours, but the average human being has about 100 to 110,000 strands of hair. But those that hate me, David says, there are more than the hairs on a person's head to say that he has an, en there's an enormous amount of adverse, what, how do I, his enemies are just, they're just enormous in number. He has a, a, a huge degree of people who are against him. And this is part of his why he's so overwhelmed uh, and he feels so deep uh, sunk into this mire. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me, mine enemies, wrongfully are mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. So it, it, it appears in this case, in order to try and appease, and it's very hard to ever, it's really hard to ever appease somebody who hates you. But it looks like he made an effort to appease that person or peoples, the many peoples who hated him, by giving something back, giving something to them that he didn't take in the first place. He was making every human effort, and this is something I think we should do. When we find ourselves in distressful situation, God gave you a brain and a mind. Use it. Use it. You are, I believe that we are to pray and we are to do everything that we possibly can that is proper, that is legitimate, that it is in accordance with God's word, everything we have in our ability to help effect the change we want to see. And, and if, it do, if we, all we, we have done all we can do, the change doesn't happen. We continue to pray to God and understand that at that point, there is a purpose. There is a divine purpose for me being left in the present situation, but I'm going to keep praying, and I'm going to keep praying, and I'm going to keep praying until one of two things happen. Until either A, the situation is resolved, or B, I am determined, I have an answer from God, at least at this point, to say, 
No. And then I will move on and trust the Lord. David goes on at 69, 14 through 15, and I'll explain why I've jumped. I just want you to see his circumstances. Deliver me out of the mire. Let me not sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not the water flood overflow me. Neither let the deep swallow me up and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me, looking at the possible death in this situation. That's how dire his circumstances were. At the extreme end, it, it appears like that he thought death could be a real possibility. I'm not going into any background of this at all. I just want you to see something else from this passage. Now, back to verse 3 that I purposely skipped. I am weary of my crying. Crying is not simply talking about tears. That's not what he has in mind. I am weary of my kara. Kara is a prayer word. It is the very same word that is used in Psalm 91 15 when he says, They who call upon me, David is calling upon God. Kara is used to, used in a prayer to ask God for help. Kara is used in prayers to ask God for help. This is a prayer asking for help. Now notice, I'm weary. The, the Hebrew word for weary, it's, it's a word that a laborer would use. The idea here is somebody who is absolutely just worn to a frazzle. He is labored laboriously in prayer. He has done so long, he's just, he's just so worn out he can't pray anymore. Uh, and I, I thought about that for a bit. And have I ever prayed about anything in my life to the, length, to, to the point that I was just fatigued? So fatigued there was nothing left in me. I just couldn't go on anymore. Well, that's what this kind of prayer is. Now, and this is how David prayers with that kind of intensity. He prayed till it was exhausting. And then he says, my throat is dried. Now, the idea of his throat being dried, uh, the, the word throat in the, is used not just simply as a throat, literally, but as an organ of speech uh, in the scripture. Uh, if you want to Psalm, Psalm, Isaiah 58, 1. So he's talking about his speech. He is, he is cried out. Apparently, this has been a uh, audible prayer to God. And he has prayed so long, so intently, that his voice his throat muscles have tightened up, they're, they're strained. Uh, now that is something <coughs> I am familiar with. Uh, it's because I have muscle tension dysphoria in, uh, in my throat. And that's not because I speak too long or so long. It is because I need to learn how to breathe. And you, th you think after all the years I have taught that I have learned how to breathe and, and speak. I haven't, and that's why you hear my throat crackle. That's why I have water with me all of the time, yeah, because my voice gets strained. And that is exactly what David is saying. He has, he has prayed so long, he, has, he, has, he is in fatigue, and his voice is strained. He says, mine eyes fail. Now, this is a metaphor that's used in Scripture uh, several times. Uh, it's uh, to, to express the, the idea that someone is waiting for something. He's waiting for such a long time. It, it, it's like when you're expecting someone to come. We used to live in the country most of my life as a kid. And you know, maybe if you're, you know, relatives, friends are coming, cousins, grandparents, whatever, you know, you, you, they're supposed to be at a certain time and you, they're not, and you're out there standing and you keep looking and, and you keep looking down the long road, hoping to see the car. It, that's the kind of the idea that uh, this word is used figuratively to express that you've waited for something for a long time. And that's when he says, my eyes fails. He has been waiting for a long time time for God's answer on his prayers. 
Psalm 119, verse 82, Psalm 119, of verse 132, Isaiah 38, 14 would give you uh, three passages that show you this figurative sense of my eyes fail of some, of meaning I've been waiting a long, long time for something I want. My eyes fail while I wait. And he's just really doubling down on his waiting and he's waiting a length of time. Now, the word waiting, two things, uh, it's not the kind of waiting that, uh, I was in the doctor's office uh, Friday uh, to get look at some of these issues. And you're sitting in a, and you're waiting, and you're waiting, and you're waiting. It's not that kind of waiting. The waiting here is a, there's an eager anticipation. That's what the Hebrew word uh, communicates. I, I'm waiting eagerly, expecting. He, he, there's an eager anticipation, just like me as a kid waiting for my, uh, maybe my cousin Steve to be coming down the road. Eager anticipation for that. that that's the thought, looking forward to something that sure, sure is going to happen. Now, and then he says, and, and I wait. And that's a PL stem in Hebrew. It's a participle. So what that is to say, this he's intently waiting and he is in that state that is a continual state of being. His fixed state right now, he is waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for God. He has been crying out to God. And what is, what's happening? Has God answered? Has he delivered? Not to this point. David is still waiting. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, a little a bitty phrase, in an acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me in the truth of thy salvation. Deliver me out of the mire. Let me not sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me out of the deep water. He waits and understands something in an acceptable time, an acceptable time. And for David, the time, and I, God did answer the prayer, but not at that time frame. It wasn't the right time. David did get a yes answer, but it was deferred. Now, I'm going to show you clearly an example. I've waited for some things. I've been waiting for one thing. Uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to think, see if I can quickly probably get this in my mind correctly, time-wise, for about uh, 40 years. That's a generation. I've been praying and praying and praying off and on again for 40 years. Because what I know I'm praying for is in accordance with God's will. I don't think I'm asking amiss, and therefore I can't believe the answer will be no. I believe it falls in the case of a, yes, Carl, but not now, Carl. Affirmative, deferred. Now, 40 years is a long time, but that doesn't even hold a matchstick to what I believe the longest length of time a person had to wait for an answer to a prayer. Now, that person, well, it's like me, and I hate it. You can see it. I still work, and so I'm oftentimes calling either clients or I'm calling vendors, interfacing with people by phone, and I hate that. Can you hold, please? And then the button goes down before you get a chance to say, no, I don't want to hold. Uh, I hate it. I call it the dreaded hold button. But in my business world, I have learned I never make a phone call that works that beside me. I can do so when I get the beep, dreaded hold button. I have something to do. But nobody likes to be put on hold and wait and wait and wait and wait. And then sometimes you get disconnected and you start over. Well, sometimes God puts us on the hold button. Never disconnects, but he has us on hold. Now, the longest per person, the longest hold period of time I found was in the case of Moses. Moses asked God to allow him to enter 
into the promised land. And you can see the verses uh, that I have, and we're going to take a, a look at just two. The Deuteronomy 3, 23, 26, where I'll show you the ask. And then the Matthew 17, 1 through 3, I'm going to show you the answer. And if you want to follow further, you could read those other passages there at the, that I have uh, cited on this slide. And I think they're in my note sheets as well. Now I want to look at the request first. We read in Deuteronomy 3, 23, it says, And I, that is Moses, besought. Besought, the Hebrew word chanan, <coughs> literally means to show favor, to be gracious. I ask God for grace. The Lord, I asked God for grace at that time. That's what he's asking for. He said, I, I besought the Lord for a favor at that <coughs> time. Sorry about my throat already. <coughs> he, <coughs> he sought the Lord for a favor, and he understands something immediately about prayer. It's something we all should understand. The word kanan means to show favor, to be gracious. Uh, and if you like those passages I have listed, would give you examples. And I think they translated grace in each of the passages, I think, in the King James that I have listed. But here, just from the Brown Rivers and Brown River, Brown Driver and Briggs Hebrew and English lexicon, here's what they how they define the word kanan. Verb, show favor, be gracious. And they believe it's derived from the Aramaic word chan. And they give a further definition. To yearn towards, to long for, be merciful, compassionate, favorable, inclined towards. So Moses is reaching out to God. He's yearning for God and asking the Lord to please be gracious to him in this, in, in this particular request. He's, the request is boxed into that grace, not that God is not always gracious, but he's asking for a special measure of grace, a favor it from God. And, and truly, that's a man who understands prayer, truly, because he understands any time that he goes to pray, and we ought to understand the same. Any time we go to pray where we're going, we're going to a throne of grace, a throne of grace. The fact that God would even entertain the thought of listening to my prayer is mind-boggling to me. And I certainly know the only reason he might do that is because of the wonder of his grace and seeing me in Christ as his child. That's why, and we know from the New Testament, we, we are exhorted from the New Testament. Let us therefore come boldly. I would rather say confidently, because sometimes boldness can be arrogant. But we can come with a true sense of humility and confidence because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Unto what? The throne of grace. Well, why are we coming there? To obtain mercy and to find grace to help in time of need. And that is what Moses was seeking. He came to God seeking favor, to seeking grace. And I besought the Lord, seeking grace at that time, saying, stop right there. Oh, I want to make a principal point. I forgot to put that in here. The believer's prayers and trust are to be anchored in the character of God. The believer's prayers and trust are to be anchored in the character of God. Whoops, my little guy is not working all of a sudden. Oh, folks, that's not very good. In fact, it's very disappointing. I do not know why it's not working. So let me try to do something by hand. I don't know if it'll let me do this or not. I know I just blocked you out. Now I'm gonna come back in in just a second and see if it will go beyond and do what it's supposed to. It absolutely will not. It will not advance. I am very, very sorry about this. That is utterly disappointing. Uh, 
for my class. Okay, now maybe we can do it from a, a, a different manner. Lisa, let me do this. Let's see. Okay, well, I'll work it from just a, a different way since it wants to fight with me. What I was back here, let me back up. I apologize I, for the technical problem. I besought the Lord, seeking grace at that time, saying, saying, and what he says is, O Lord, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty hand for what god is there in heaven who can do according to thy works and according to thy might now what i want to see and if i can make this i'll try it once again if it doesn't we'll try and get back out of here but see if it'll work from a normal sense now okay if we can go back here for just a minute and i can't it just will not do that okay well, well, I should have just I left well enough alone. Okay, we're going to try one more time. <laughs> I want you to pick up through here some things. O oh Lord, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness. Begun to show just the beginning, much more. And thy might, mighty hand, your power. For what God is in heaven who can do according to thy works? None. There is no God in heaven on earth. There isn't any God who can do like what the Lord our God can do. He and he alone is truly God and can do these things in according again to thy might. So what the point is I was trying to make before this thing all messed up on me is if you look at what David just did, his prayer is rooted, it is anchored, in God. His trust is fixed on the character of God that he is just barely beginning to scratch the surface of. And so with us today. I can teach, and I truly could do this, the remaining years of my life on the character of God. And I would tell you, we have just scratched the surface on the character of God. But see, based upon what little bit he knows about the character of God, the greatness of God, the mighty power of God. That is what his prayer rests upon. And your prayer and my prayer were to rest upon the character of God. That's what we're to trust. So now we'll get to the ask. Here's the ask of his prayer. And I'm stubborn enough. I'm going to try this one more time. This is the ask of Moses a prayer. Uh, the ask is, I pray thee, based upon your nature, your character, your power, your grace, your love, all of you, all of the things I know about you, I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond the Jordan, that godly mountain in Lebanon, Deuteronomy 3.25. Moses is asking we're at the end of the 40 years of the wilderness. The people are ready to cross over the Jordan and enter into the promised land. And Moses asked, can I please just go into the promised land? That's all he wanted to do. Not a great big thing, just to go in. And you would think after all Moses did, putting up with these people for 40 years, I, I just can't imagine all that this man went through. Just the responsibility alone, and I know a little about responsibility, but not his kind of responsibility. Nothing like that. That weight and that burden and all that he did, that this is not, it's not too big an ask. So that's what he wanted to do. That's, that's the ask. And the word nah, I should point that out. That, and I'm not going to try and go back. I think that's where I have the issues with that. Uh, the word nah, that is, I, when, he's, when he says that he, He's asking the Lord, and I besought, O oh Lord. He, the ask here, nah, is a little word that says, please, I am begging you, I pray. And it's used as an emphasis, as I've got up here from the Dictionary of Biblical Languages with Semantic Domains, it is used as a marker of emphasis. 
uh, it places desire, it, it takes the desire of the speaker, in this case Moses, the prayer, and it heightens the sense of urgency on the part of the speaker. I, I mean, he, he is really, really pleading, pleading with the Lord. Uh, he wants desperately the Lord to answer his prayer in what you and I, what I've called a affirmative positive. But, but the Lord was angry with me. See, now he's telling all this, I should have set this up. He's telling all this to the people of Israel, knowing he's not going to go in with them. But the Lord was angry with me for your sakes. Well, not completely. The problem was that Moses manifested a lack of trust in the Lord and disobedience in the Lord uh, at the instance of water when he was told to do one thing, but struck the rock with uh, the rod that it performed the first time. And so God disciplined. And the discipline that was given to Moses, that discipline was you're not going to enter the promised land. And that's what he's saying here. But the Lord was angry with me for your sakes and would not hear me. No, God did hear him. And you'll see. And the Lord said unto me, Let it suffice thee, speak ye no more, speak no more unto me of this matter. Yeah, he heard him and said, Matter closed. Don't, don't, don't talk to me again about it. In other words, don't bring this prayer to me again. Okay? And that's why I told you when I think I'm in one of a deferred affirmative, I'm going to pray and pray and pray and pray and pray until I, for, I find out for sure I've got a no answer, then I stop. Moses got what he thought was a no answer. God didn't say no. He said, speak no more unto me of this matter. Uh, God heard the matter. Just don't say anything more to me. That's it. I don't want to talk again about it. Now, that's the prayer of Moses. Now, I would like you to move you to Matthew 17, 1, where we read, after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, that's John the Apostle, uh, John the Beloved, his brother, and bringing them up into a high mountain privately. Those of you who are used to hearing me teach and know me, know how fixated I get on wanting to know where something took place. Uh, the reason for that is, again, it just, to me, uh, this is not a story, okay? This is not a story. This took place in time, space, and at a point, at a place on earth. Now, the high mountain, how, <laughs> yes, the high mountain privately. I did a little work with that, and I'm going to give you three possibilities for the high mountain that this might have taken place on. One is Mount Tabor. As you can see, Mount Tabor is shaped almost like a half sphere. It just suddenly, boom, pops up out from the flat ground surroundings. And there it is. And its, its height is uh, 1,866 or 1,886, I forget. I think it's the latter. 20 feet one way or the other. 1,886 feet high. And, and, and there, there it is. Uh, it's located in uh, Galilee uh, and actually in lower Galilee. Here's another, uh, this will show you uh, where I say in, in Lower Galilee, you can see the Sea of Galilee uh, right up here in this area. And so you, and then you can see that I have pointed Mount Tabor. This is one place that people, in, in fact, uh, I believe it was uh, the, the traditional uh, place uh, that uh, the, the early church, uh, uh, somehow decided it was here in the around the, the 400s or someplace. If you go to Mount Tabor, and I was in Israel, I didn't go. Uh, you'd find a Catholic and a Greek Orthodox shrine set up there at the top, thinking that this was uh, the place. Now, you, the map, you're about 11 miles west of, of the Sea of Galilee uh, from here. Uh, though, Though the early church, early church history, and many will tell you this is a probable place, I'm not sure that I really buy that. I have some, I have some doubts, and I'll explain why. Uh, one, one of those doubts come from the fact that, that I know two things for sure, that at the time of Jesus, Mount Tabor, uh, the Romans had a, a garrison of soldiers on the mount, 
I also know that the Sanhedrin used it. Uh, it was one of the mounts they signaled the rising of the of the new moon for to, indi to indicate the beginning of the new month. They had uh, guys up there with uh, torches and big lantern type things to send out the signal by light. And I know typically when Jesus went away to pray, he went away to get privacy, away from where people might be coming up, down. And so, you know, you, you got the Roman garrison, you got soldiers moving around that area. You got Sanhedrin with their people uh, go, moving around up there. I, so I question that, and, and there's yet a, a third reason, uh, and that has to do with the distance, and I'll get in that in a bit where I think Jesus, well, I know where they were, uh, at, at least at the starting point of this. Uh, here's a quote from, uh, well, there's another. This is looking at Mount Tabor from uh, the Valley of Jezreel. And if you remember in the Valley of Jezreel, that, that is the place uh, where uh, Deborah, who did she, who was Deborah's general, Carl? I cannot think of Deborah's general, but it was in that, maybe it popped my mind. It was in this valley uh, that they defeated the Syrians, got themselves set free. But that's just another view. And I think I have one with a city right up next to it. Yeah, this is, you can see the town now that surrounded modern day Mount Tabor. That's one possible place. But here's what it had a Torah portions. It's, it's a website. Uh, and here is what one of their scholars uh, said about Mount Tabor being uh, the place for a uh, the transfiguration. Occupied, seeing occupied is a key word here. Occupied Mount Tabor does not seem like an appropriate place for the private mystical revelation of the transfiguration and it isn't then i agree with it because of what i know was going on in mount tabor at that time but nevertheless that is what the church tradition holds the uh, catholic church would tell you that today greek orthodox church would tell you that today i would tell you it's it's possible it's possible uh, but i have other places that i think are more probable a second place uh, that some point to is Mount Meron. Now, Mount Meron is uh, northwest of the Sea of Galilee. And here is a map where I can, you can see Mount Moron rather easily. And here, you're seeing you're going north and you're going west up here to the Sea of Galilee. So that gives you a physical place for Mount uh, Moron. Uh, Moron, Mount Meron uh, being the place. Uh, Mount Meron is, is being uh, the, well here I can get out one more for you and I'm going to give you the third place so you can see the relation of all. Mount Hermon, that's the third place right up here. So uh, there are, these are the, the, the possible places I didn't draw my should have drawn you in line. Here's Mount Tabor from here, that's one possible place. Mount Meron, another possible place and Mount Hermon, another possible place. Now I have pointed out Caesarea of Philippi for a reason. So see where it is fixed relative to all the, oh, to Mount Hermon, where it is fixed relative to Mount Meron, and where it is fixed relative to Mount Tabor. Now, uh, Mount Hermon, I'll give, give some pictures of it. Uh, this is Mount Hermon. Uh, and it is the highest uh, mountain peak range uh, that is in uh, is Israel. It's it runs uh, a part of a mountain cl a cluster that runs alongside of they call them the Lebanese mountains, I think, or Lebanon mountains, the Syrian Lebanese uh, border. And that Mount Hermon sits on on that area. Uh, it part of the Golan Heights, which I did go to when we were there. Uh, it's uh, uh, Mount Hermon is really high compared to the other elevations, 6,690 or 906, 6,690 6, feet uh, elevation. It sits on the southern slope uh, of uh, that whole peak along the way. Now, it was about the fourth century that, uh, let me show you some others. Uh, it's just a beautiful place. You can see still snow capped. Uh, while it's green here in, in, in the middle of, of the valley. Uh, I have one more, yeah. You see it really gets covered with snow uh, because of its elevation, just a beautiful place. Uh, 
and Eusebius. He's a church historian about the fourth century, uh, and he's also a bishop of Caesarea, Philip by Caesarea. Eusebius in the fourth century, as far as I could find, was the first person who thought perhaps, he doesn't say with any degree definitive, he puts it out as a possibility that Mount Hermon might have been the place for uh, the transfiguration of, that took place. This might took, have taken place on Mount Hermon. Uh, and after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, in bringing them up to a high mountain privately. Now, uh, the six days, see, they're, they're rather ambiguous. Uh, six days after what? <laughs> There's some possibilities for those six days that then might not be fixed. What's the best, best mountain? Uh, and says it was transfigured before them, and his face did shine like the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Uh, well, I, I guess I took out, I didn't think I was going to have time. Let me very quickly uh, say what I w wanted to tell you about the six days. I think those s six days uh, refer to the time after Jesus uh, made, uh, made, the time after Jesus ask, who do people say I am? And some said uh, that you're Elijah. Some said that you're the prophet. And it was Peter who said that you're the son of the living God. That's who you are. You're Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus, you don't tell anybody else this. That happened at Philippi, Caesarea of Philippi. That's where that happened. And I wish I had left that map up. I'm going to see if I, if I do this. It's a little different, but perhaps it'll let me do what I want to do. I took this out of my notes. And I said I don't have time. While I'm looking, I'm going to squeeze time and talk faster. This is Caesarea Philippi. This is where Jesus was, I think, six days before the transfiguration. That's where I really believe he was. That's where he was when he asked when when he asked the question which i just explained that peter answered it was a caesarea at philippi so if he's at caesarea at philippi uh and then six days later we have the mount of transfiguration uh, i figured out the time and i, and I have the mile in some place i probably took it out of my notes but i certainly know he could have walked it is possible leaving Caesarea Philippi, they could have walked in six days down to Mount Tabor. I think it's 60, close to 70 miles in distance. They could have walked it. They also could have walked uh, up to Mount Meron, which is in close to 40 miles. They could have walked either place in six days. Uh, but it just seems to make more sense to me. This is where they were, they were at. And in six days, it, you have nothing about any ministry going on, speak of. So I think they were here. That's what I believe. I think it's where they were. So, after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up to a high mountain. Luke really says the mountain, and that if you're talking about the mountain, and you lived in that area, the mountain, because simply of its height, would have been Mount Hermon, not Mount Tabor, not Mount Moran, but Mount Hermon. Took them up to a mountain, probably Mount Herman privately, and let me get this thing reset if I can find it quick enough. Privately, not from the beginning. Oh boy, I made a mistake. I'm going to keep talking really fast as I move this thing uh, forward. I am so sorry for all of my technical goof ups today. Uh, but as, as I, I keep moving, I think that is where this took place on Mount Tabor. And, and we're told after six days, uh, Jesus taketh Peter, James, John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain privately, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine like the sun, and his raiment was as white as the light. And he then says, behold, the word behold, when you reach that passage in Matthew chapter 17 at verse 3, is the word idu. 
And the word idu, behold, is a word that's meant to be an attention getter. The word is to grab your attention, say, pay, look up, pay attention, something important to tell you. And I need you to listen. I need you to see this. Do not miss it. That's the point. And again, I think all of this took place right here on Mount Tabor because they were at Caesarea Philippi just prior to that happening. Now, the thing in, that I need you to take attention of to be hold is who was there with Jesus. And we see from the text, the one who was with Jesus, behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah with him. Moses and Elijah with him. Where's Mount Tabor? In the land of Israel. Where is Moses? In the land of Israel. Moses asked just to go into the land. That's all he asked. We see Moses in the land. I would tell you, and I believe, God answered Moses' prayer. Now, I will grant you, Moses was on hold for quite a long time, probably about 1,400 to 1,500 years, probably closer to the 15, but I think a little less, somewhere between 1,400 and 15 years later, there we see Moses, the lawgiver. There we see him on either Mount Tabor, Mount Hermon, or Mount uh, Maron. In all probability, Mount Hermon in the land of Israel. God's answer to Moses' prayer was not no, but wait a while, 1,400 years plus. You see, sometime God answers our prayers in a deferred manner. Yes, but deferred. I'm going to have to do these really quick. And Abraham said unto God, by second example, God, what will thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And then we read in verse 3, And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is my heir. So Moses is Moses. Abram is seek, if seeking God in prayer for a child. He remains childless. And God had given him a promise in Genesis 12, 2. Reiterated the promise again in Genesis 13 uh, that Abraham would be given a son. And now here's Abraham. He's old. He's 85 years old. I'll show you in a minute. And God, he still doesn't have a son. So I think he's asking, did I misunderstand? What's going on? What's going on? Where's my son? Is, is, is it going to be this Eliezer? And again, let me go back to verse 1 and explain. No, I can't. I just don't. I'm sorry. I don't have time. I wish I could, but I don't think I will get through this if I do that. Abraham believed that he would die childless. That's what he believed uh, in, in that context. And so he addresses God. This is the first time, by the way, Lord, Adonai, Adonai Yahweh. First time we hear the name Adonai used by a person in the scripture. And the word Adonai, a good translation, is uh, reward. Uh, it's a word that means reward, master, a title of the true God. And here's the underscoring for us what the focus on authority. So Moses was coming to God, and when he dresses as Adonai, he's dressing him, he's saying, I am in submission to your authority. So this is a prayer saying, Lord, my, I'm going to be childless. But if that is, if that is your sovereign decision, then I will submit to your authority. So he's not a prayer wailing and moaning and trying to change God's mind. He's trying to misunderstand something. Where's my child? But if it's not to be, it's not to be. And I trust you and your authority. 
let me finish. Let me just read that whole thing, which I, well, I can't do. I know I can't do it with this now. Meaning, Lord, formally, majestic Yahweh is a title of the true God with focus on authority and implying majesty of a ruler, but implying also a relationship based in a promise, a covenant, or relational factors. That's how this word Adonai is used. So Abraham had willingly placed himself under the sovereign leadership of God. That's the point. Okay, He is submissive to God's authority as we must be when we go to any kind of prayer. And we read in Genesis 12 too, and I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. Well, to make Abraham a great nation from Abraham's mind, a great people, he was going to have to have a progeny. He didn't have one. And so, behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir, and that is this Eleazar, who is obviously a very loyal servant of Abraham, born under Abraham's family tent, so to speak. Now, the Lord says, and behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This one, this Eliezer of Damascus, shall not be thine heir, but he that cometh forth out of thine own loins shall be thine heir. So God's no, no, you're going to have a child. Now, Sarah came up with her plan, as most of us know, and Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abraham had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan. He had already been in the land of Canaan 10 years. He entered the land of Canaan when he was 75 years old. Remember, he made the trip up from Ur of the Chaldees, and he stayed in Haran. Now, I don't know how long he was here in Haran uh, in this area, but from there, he left and went into the land of Canaan. Abram left Haran when he was 75 years old, Genesis 12, 4, and 5. Abraham came into the land of Canaan when he was 75 years old. You can verify that in those verses. Sarah gave Hagar to Abraham 10 years later. That makes him 85 years old, Genesis 16, 3. Then we find Abraham for sure being 85 years old when he, God says, Yes, to his prayer. I'm going to give you one of your own loins to be your heir. Genesis 15, 2 through 4, God says yes to the prayer. Now, and Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. A hundred years old. Abraham was 85 when God said yes. He was a hundred when God answered. That is a time lapse of 15 years. Answer, affirmative, deferred. Sometimes God answers our pray prayers in that sense. Abram was 100 years old when he received the fulfillment of God's answer to his prayer. One of the ways that God answers our prayers is yes, but not immediately. You're going to have to wait sometimes. Now, none of us are going to wait 1,400 years for an answer, but look at Abraham. A long, long, long wait. Sometimes God will say, I need you to wait. There's nothing wrong with what you're asking, nothing at all. It's just a time is off. God might immediately answer yes when we're in trouble, when we're in distress. And he also might answer, you have to wait a while. You have to wait a while. We may receive either answer to our answers when we are in times of distress. In Psalm 91 15, says he will answer yes immediately. Yes, but wait a while. Now let me quickly try and get through several things. These are what I call my theological and practical impact. These are things for me personally. These are my own personal readouts from my life. You may find them applicable to you. 
you may not. And if you don't, that's quite fine. You, we're not, no two of us are exactly in the exact, exact same place spiritually in our walk with the Lord. We're all individual and different. Uh, your thumbprint told me, I knew that years ago. My thumbprint told me that. Now I know the DNA tells me far more uh, the reality of that truth that we're each individual. We each have individual personal relationship with God. I, the only reason I started doing this is I was, it, I was strongly urged by some, several men in the ministry I respect. Uh, my fear was always people would take and say, well, this is what Pastor Carl does. You got to do it. No, this is how it affected me. One, I know and I knew this was reaffirmation for me that I can offer my prayers constantly to God, confidently, but that never arrogantly. They should always be with true humility of soul, spirit, reverence in light of who I'm coming to in awe of God and a willingness to submit to the answer that God gives, to trust him, to trust him to answer at the right time time believing as my little clock shows even though i hate sometimes the whole button i know god's timing is always perfect if our answers are not answered yes and immediately do not conclude the answer is no be patient wait upon the lord and continue to pray for the answer may be yes but deferred as all of those passages show and will show in your note sheets don't stop praying just because you don't get the answer immediately. If our prayers are not answered immediately, it does not necessarily mean we're asking for the wrong thing or even that we're asking for a miss, but that this is not the right time. Keep praying. Four, God may delay answers to our prayers, but he will never, never, never be late in giving an answer to our prayers. God may delay answers to our prayers to give us opportunities to trust him more fully, to manifest our faith in him, to do, to know what is best for us, to respond to us from his loving, gracious, kind, benevolent heart, and to do what is best for us when it is best for us. So it helps us develop trust God may delay answering our prayers to draw us to focus on him, on him and not our circumstances. God may delay answering our prayers because the delay will bring greater glory to God, as did these prayers I show you in John 9, 137 of the blind man, and as did the prayer uh, that you see in uh, John 11 also, on behalf of Lazarus, where Jesus purposely delayed so that God might be glorified with greater glory. God is not, and I'm going to touch upon this a little more next week, God is not ignoring our plight when he delays and answering our prayers. Don't think you're being ignored. I wish I had time, and I really, I know I don't. I will look at this a little more next week because I want you to understand when you're on the whole button, what your father is doing for you. I'm sorry about my technical issues today. I pray they did not track too greatly from our time together in the word. And that I pray that as a result of our time together in the word, you will be encouraged to continue to pray for those things that are needful in your life and to wait and to trust God for the perfect time for an answer. Lord bless you and thank you for being with me today in the Word.